First of all, I would like to begin by suggesting that this incarnational principle, which is at the heart of the mystical experience. So you see Bernini trying to capture that in the, the, the ecstasy of Teresa of Avila in that statue there in Rome, Maria della Victoria Church. The first, this, the, the incarnational principle about this, the body, is that the body does not end with the skin. That there is a consciousness that comes in Christ, this cosmic Christ, this, this spirited consciousness, that, that the body, who I am, the body that I am, is, does not end with my skin but that cultivating this experience, one realizes that we are in communion with all of the incarnate physical cosmos, that that is our body. I do an exercise with my students that was given to me by my mentor, David Power, over dinner one night. I was asking him, how do we get to the notion of transubstantiation? And to one of the young seekers that have asked to, to talk to me, uh, he, he asked me, what do I believe I receive when I receive the body of Christ? The body, there's that word again, the body of Christ. He says, what do you believe you receive? And I shared what David Power shared with me. He gave me this as a gift, and I've been using it. I shared it with this friend of mine who is a, kind of a non-believer, but is certainly on the path of expanding consciousness. But it's not institutionalized, you, you know, the spiritual, not religious thing, right? But quite spiritual. So what I do is I, I took a loaf of bread from the restaurant table and I said, now look deeply into this loaf of bread and see what you see. Because this will answer your question, what do I believe I receive when I receive the body of Christ? What do you see in this loaf of bread? And this friend said, uh, well, I see... Um, Color. I says, yes, it's color. Look more deeply, what else do you see? And then he says, oh, I see a wheat field. I says, yes. And what else do you see? I see the sunshine, good. And I see water, and I see Lake Michigan, right? And there's the Pacific Ocean. And then you see rain and acid rain because of human pollution that we create is in here. And what else do you see in the bread? There's farmers, and there's... Um, chickens because there's eggs in the bread and then there's worms because there's dirt in the bread, there's soil in the bread. And there's cows because there's milk and eggs and chickens and cows and yes, and then there's, then there's fertilizer in the bread because you have to have fertilizer, natural manure and other kinds there, they're in the bread. What else do you see? And he was stumped, and I says, well, there are mouths in the bread. There, look at all the mouths of hungry people, the hungry children, the people down in now in Houston that are that hungry, starving kids in Africa. They're in here. Can you see them? He says, yeah. I says, what else do you see? Come on. I says, there's ovens in the bread. There's fire here. Fire, not only the sun and the stars, but there's fire, and there's ovens of Auschwitz and Dachau and ovens that destroyed humanity, Jews, because of hatred. It's all in the bread. I says, what else do you see? And so he went on and he talked about grandmother's hands and memories and Thanksgiving dinners and, and then he talked about meals where people didn't talk because they were angry at one another and then he saw in the bread, he also saw stardust and 
and he saw molecules of dead ancestors, and Moses was in the bread because nothing is created or destroyed, and the molecules are still around. He says, look, what else do you see? And he came up with all kinds of other things. I says, now, take all of that what you see in the bread. Take it all. Because over all of that bread, the church says, this is my body. Over all of that, the ritual says, this is my body. And then we eat the bread of death, the death of Christ, so that we then can eat the bread of life. And then we are in communion with all of that body. When I did that at the restaurant, at the end, he cried, this young man, he cried, 26-year-old. And I said to myself, this, this is what Paul Ricoeur talks about. The symbol gives rise to thought. The symbol donne à, la, à, donne à penser. It, it's, it, I just did this little exercise to explain what I believe I receive in communion. And he wept because he got at some level. And that is a form of, of, of mystical consciousness that is that's very cosmic, but it's encoded, embedded in the Catholic ritual behaviors. And it demands, if you would, a certain amount of, of relinquishment or surrendering of the egoic thinking that my body is only what's here. And therefore I have to I have to, uh, because the body has as its fundamental instinct survival. And the, the egoic wants us to keep surviving, to hold on. And sometimes, unfortunately, Catholicism has Christianity, and this is what I think these, these young people are reacting against. Christianity has said you have to save your soul. It's all about self-preservation, rather, rather than covenantal agapic washing of feet. All about saving your soul. And it just fortified the egoic into a scrupulosity that many of us have. When I was a kid, along with all of this mystical stuff, there was a scrupulosity that grew up inside of me. That God didn't love me. That, there was, that I was like I was a sinner. And, and now the new diagnostic manual, the psychological manual, DM, DSM number five or six, whatever number it is, scrupulosity in religious traditions is considered a mental illness. It's, it's in the family of OCD. Hmm? And I was captured by it because, because unfortunately sometimes in the desire to cause people to become holy, we turned it into an effort done by works and actions rather than by grace. And so this question that you get about the body, it's very simple, that, the, that one, 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 one begins to sense that the Eucharistic experience, as it accelerates us into this consciousness, is to say that when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are in communion with Christ, and Christ is the cosmic Lord who fills the universe in all its parts, the multiverses in all its parts and that we become identified with it. But since survival in the physical form, survival is an instinct so, I, I, I was noticing it <laughs> the other day in Africa. I was in Africa visiting a friend and you have to get malaria shots, not malaria shots, malaria pills, right? Because of mosquitoes and mosquitoes. Even in mosquitoes is the desire to survive. There was a mosquito that appeared in my room. And I tried to swat it and it was fighting me and trying to run away and, and save itself and survive. Even a mosquito has it in his body, in its body. And the desire for survival is a consciousness, once you're aware, it's a fundamental biological consciousness that is, I think, the opponent to dying. And so, in a sense, 
when we celebrate the Eucharist, we surrender even that fundamental desire to survive. Kenosis with Eros. We surrender our desire to survive to God. And in surrendering the desire to survive, now we find a new way of surviving by dying so that the body, the body is the body of Christ. And it's this lovely experience and that is not about my grabbing on in a contract, but loving. And I have to say this with sincerity to both of you. I'm not sure, and again, I'm not sure yet, this is just a speculation, that if you can't do this with one person, can you do it with many? Does the and again, I, I, again, friendship, therefore, becomes paradigmatic here. Friendship. Because friendship could include everyone and not just simply, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a different form of relating, friendship. It even has a different purpose than marriage. But I'm wondering, I speculate, if, if I am not able to love this way with one other human being in the cauldron of, of, of uh, my own confrontation with my own survival in relating, I want my thought to be, you know. I want my way, I want my experience in relating. I'm wondering if I can't do this with another human. Can I do this with a group? Just a question. This is why I think when Jesus says in the Gospel, when two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. That it's easy for me to do this when there's a whole crowd of people in this building. But when I have to go loggerheads with one other human being, can I relinquish the survival of my own attitudes. And this gets us to the key word, which is metanoia. In the Catholic, the Christian tradition, the word metanoia is what Jesus says at the beginning of his ministry. But even before he, he, he they, they want to know, where do you live? You know, let us talk to, talk to us in the Gospel of John. Talk to us, Jesus. And then he says, come and see. Come and see. You know, let me sit down. We'll sit down and talk. But in the other Gospels, he preaches. And John the Baptist does the same thing, and they use the word metanoiain. And literally, that word metanoia, it's connected to the body and to death and to all of this. Metanoia is connected because it means to go beyond the mind. Meta, beyond, and noia, for the nous or the consciousness, go beyond the present state of consciousness. And so this journey of Christian death is a journey of relinquishing the present states of mind. Dying and dying. And I think, for me, at least I've experienced this, in relating with another human being who is on a similar path. Just when I thought I was dead, <laughs> I become a mosquito and try to survive again. <laughs> but it's so tricky because it's all thoughts. It's all, just in the, it's all just in the brain. Those are brain waves. But there's something more deep to consciousness that is able to love. To love. It's because these, these bodies, we can get confused, think that these are just our bodies. But, but if, you, if you say the body is more than the skin, then all of a sudden you're in a new state of consciousness right there.